Earth is a dynamic planet, not only biologically, but also geologically. The ground we stand upon is actually not all that firm, and I am not just talking about quicksand. Continents are moving and getting ripped apart as you just sit there watching YouTube. The process is so slow, though, we cannot perceive this. All we see is a static landscape. However, sometimes geology happens much faster and in such a dramatic fashion as to make us question the very stability and immutability of the ground beneath our feet. And few geological phenomena are as spectacular as an erupting volcano. The molten rock that is always there, far below our feet, bubbling, or sometimes more like exploding, from the ground. Despite the total devastation such eruptions cause, in a testament to the adaptability of life, some can find a way to comfortably live alongside volcanoes and exploit these geological features to the fullest. In this episode on misconceptions people have about the natural world, I hope to show that while volcanoes are a force of destruction, they are also givers of new life, all while living on top of an erupting volcano. Hello all. I thought the best way to start discussing sort of nature misconceptions for this new season of the Nature Misconception series was to see what the internet was saying, what the, what the internet was saying, especially in one of those AI written content farms of like those top 10, top five videos. So which is why I'll be reacting to uh, top five ways to survive a volcano on the channel Argus, a channel that definitely exists and isn't just me asking an AI to write videos for this series. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna get started. Um, I have them downloaded in my computer. I'm drinking uh, Black Widow Cider. You know, I have a video on the truth about Black Widows if you want to uh, check that out. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started with this reaction video. I'm excited. Let's see what let's see what what people are saying about those volcanoes. Hello, and welcome to the most Intense explosive voice. video on the internet. We are talking about volcanoes, those fiery mountains that cause destruction and mayhem in a matter of seconds. But don't worry, we're that here to show you very how to survive fake. one of these natural disasters. Here's everything you need that to looks know real. from avoiding a lava e demise to escaping a, a pyroclastic e flow in like style, and why a damp rag might be the key to your That's survival. That's an N95 mask. Number one, no, the warning signs. Okay. First things first, you need to know the warning signs of a volcanic eruption. Keep an eye out for increased seismic activity, ground swelling and changes in the shape of the volcano. And of course, if you see ash and smoke coming out of the top, it's time to start running. Number two. Okay, okay. Yeah, no sh**. Um, I am basing many of my comments on the CDC's specific recommendations when it comes to volcano safety. Uh, generally speaking, though only a few volcanoes actually have these sort of long-term monitoring programs, somebody's going to notice that something's off with the volcano and be able to put an area on notice just in case an evacuation is necessary. But yes, like knowing the warning signs so like you're not completely dependent on other people is probably good advice. Okay. Um, let's see what number two says. Two, get to higher ground. Oh wait, I just wanted to say, no, Anakin, I have the high ground now. Don't you try it, Anakin, I have the high ground. If you're in the vicinity of a volcano, the first thing you should do is get to higher ground. No, the Anakin, further away you I are have from the volcano, ground. the safer you'll be. And remember, lava flows like molasses, so there's plenty of time to make a run for it. Yeah, so I did make the Star a couple Star Wars references in there um, because I thought that was funny. But uh, lava may sometimes be slow, but other parts of volcanoes like pyroclastic flows are not. And so you can't really outrun those. So hopefully you're evacuated before a pyroclastic flow happens. But um, yeah, if lava, lava flows are um, headed your way, you should leave. Uh, you can, it's it's preferable if you drive rather than walk um, 
because using a vehicle for evacuation is faster. Um, when I lived on an erupting volcano, uh, we had a volcano prep, uh, we had a, we had a vehicle prepped, um, for evacuation just in case. Interestingly though, um, getting to the high ground, according to the CDC, actually doesn't have anything to do with lava or pyroclastic flows. It's because of volcanic mud flows called lahars, which come through, uh, which they come through or a rock fall sort of blocking a river, making them rise. Um, and a big lahar, so these big volcanic mud flows can be over a hundred meters deep. So like, yeah, you want to, you want to get to the higher ground and not, you know, get drowned in a, in, I mean, you won't drown, you'll get steamed, you'll get cooked alive in a lahar, but, um, you don't want that. Okay. Number three, three, have an escape plan. It's also important to have an escape plan. That looks in case terrible. Volcanic eruption. Make sure you know the best evacuation routes that guy's and just have going a for a run. meeting place for your loved ones. And remember, when it comes to volcanoes, it's better to be safe than sorry. Just ask the people of Pompeii. They'll tell you all about the importance of having a solid escape plan. That seems cruel. Um, yeah, so an evacuation plan is a good idea. However, it can be unpredictable um, because... The lot volcano might go this way, might go that way, and block a road. Um, so most likely you will follow if you have to evacuate a specifically designated evacuation route by the authorities. So you want to keep up with updates uh, through like a TV or the radio or the internet. Um, you should also just be prepared for evacuation with a kit, um, with a we um, with at least a week of your uh, medical prescriptions a flashlight and extra batteries, a first aid kit and manual, emergency food and water, uh, a manual can opener. You don't want electric because you don't want to run out of power and be unable to open your can of beans. Uh, you need, again, your week's worth of essential medications, sturdy shoes. You don't want to be escaping from a volcano and flip-flops. Um, you need, might need a respiratory or um, breathing protection, so a mask. Um, eye protection is important, like goggles, a battery-powered radio to stay up to date with um, sort of updates, and then obviously, you know, in your vehicle, you want food, flares, clean water, a fire, extinguish a fire extinguisher, sleeping bags, booster cables, extra batteries, maps, tools for vehicle, uh, tools for the vehicle, in your vehicle for your evacuation. So you want kind of a personal set um, kit, and a vehicle um, evacuation kit. Number four, protect your respiratory system. If you find yourself caught in the middle of a volcanic eruption, it's important to protect your respiratory system. Wear a mask or hold a damp cloth over your face to filter out the ash and other dangerous particles in the air. Number five. Okay, so yeah, um, if your eyes, nose, throat is irritated by volcanic fumes, you need to leave the area. Um, as for ash falls specifically, yes, you should wear protection. A mask like a common nuisance dust mask isn't gonna give you much protection. You really need an N95 respirator. Um, but really, if there's ash fall, you need to be staying inside without air circulation, so no fans, no AC, everything kind of closed up. Outside, you need to wear like long sleeves, but also you need goggles to keep the ash out of your eyes. You don't want those particles in your eyes because eyes are quite fragile. Stay calm. Finally, the most important thing to do in any emergency situation is to stay calm. Panic will only make things worse. So take a deep breath, stay focused, and follow your escape plan. We're so um, honestly, that's really good advice, but probably this video could have expounded on that more because people panic. Um, even if you tell them not to, this is, it's a problem. People do this sort of stuff. You know, you say, Hey, don't panic. People are going to panic. Um, so anyway, uh, to help you in case of a volcanic eruption, I, um, I asked an AI to write a uh, meditation to help you stay calm during a volcanic eruption. Okay. So here we go. Okay, find a quiet, safe place to sit down and close your eyes. 
Take a deep breath in and exhale slowly. Imagine a warm, glowing light surrounding you, protecting you from the outside world. As you breathe, visualize the lava flowing down the volcano like a river. Imagine yourself floating calmly on the river, letting it take you downstream. As you float, take note of your surroundings. The air might be thick with ash and smoke, but you remain safe and calm on your journey. Take a deep breath and exhale slowly. As you exhale, imagine releasing any fear or anxiety you may feel. You are in control of your thoughts and emotions. Even though the world around you may seem chaotic, you can remain calm and centered. Visualize yourself as a tree, firmly rooted in the earth. Even if the volcano rages around you, you remain strong and steadfast. Take another breath in, deep breath in, and exhale slowly. You are safe, you are strong, and you will get through this. When you're ready, slowly open your eyes and take a moment to ground yourself in the present moment. Remember, you have the power to stay calm and centered, even in the face of adversity. So hopefully that helps expand on this video. Okay, let's see what the wrap up is. There you have it, folks. Everything you need to know to survive a volcanic eruption. Just remember, the key to survival is preparation. So make sure you have a solid escape plan in place before the next eruption strikes. While you wait, remember to like and subscribe. Uh, yeah, that's a little morbid. Um, so basically, I think this video was all right. Um, could have had more information. That's my big criticism with this video. Could have had more information. Um, but none of the advice is like really bad. It's just sort of bare bones and should have been further fleshed out, which I hope my commentary has sort of done. Anyway, on with the video. For a couple of months during 2021, I decided to go live on an erupting volcano. Sometimes you just need a change of scenery after months of lockdown. I lived just a few steps from the rim of this volcano's caldera. This is Kilauea on the big island of Hawaii, one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. Surrounding the volcano, there are diverse landscapes. From lush rainforest, to the devastation caused by recent eruptions, and even vents where water from springs inside the earth get a little too close to the lava and steam rises out of the ground like when I forget about the tea kettle on my stove. In some areas, mixing with volcanic sulfur and picking up a distinctive rotten egg smell. These are some sulfur bank sulf sulfur deposits um, from Kilauea. They're very brightly colored, just this like yellow chartreuse. It's quite exciting and pretty. As you can see, we are up on the crater rim of Kilauea. Actually, we're in sort of on the rim of a smaller crater, Kilauea, Kilauea Iki, with the primary Kilauea crater on um, over there on the other side. You can see the volcanic gases and steam rising out in front of Mauna Loa. I'm on what is called the Escape Road, which is a road that leads out of the park which exists just in case lava covers the regular road so that there are ways out in case the volcano erupts and covers this, this sort of summit area with a stream of lava, which is just part of uh, sort of coexisting with volcanoes, is especially an active, super active volcano like Kilauea is just to have all these contingencies in place. Well, I'm down in the Kilauea crater, standing on lava that looks like just the frozen waves of a lava lake. I think kind of this more smooth thing, this smooth surface is what is known as uh, pahoho lava, which is smooth and, and wonderful. I think over there we'll get to the other kind, which is not so smooth and wonderful. But as you can see, it's a pretty open, desolate space, but there are trees growing, ohia trees, out on this lava field. 
as the rock is slowly reclaimed by the ecosystem. And these sort of big, open, desolate lava habitats are actually an in kind of unique ecosystem here that many different um, invertebrates have learned to sort of take advantage of. There's wolf spiders, there's crickets that live down in the cracks and are sort of the first animals to, to enter and start living here. I mean, some of them actually only like really fresh lava uh, um, fields, not like this one, where this one already has like trees and stuff. They like it before all that, it's just desolate. Kind of like walking across like an ocean, it feels like, just like, it feels like there's waves and stuff. You can feel the heat from, from the, from the uh, earth beneath us. It's, it's kind of disconcerting, but really cool. Well, as promised, um, I am no longer on Pohoho. I am on the other main type of uh, lava rock, uh -uh, which is this terrible. It's just these loose chunks of like knobby uh, rock that kind of like shift under your feet and it's rougher and harder to walk on. It's a whole different thing. Uh, of course, we still have plants growing on it. So yeah, so that's the other type of lava um, commonly found here on Hawaii is the aas. You have, you know, sort of jaggedy, knobbly aha, uh -huh, and then you got nice, smooth, flat pahoho. Few natural forces on Earth are more powerful than a volcano. And around the world, they have been a source of wonder and respect for their ability to both destroy but also create rich volcanic soils, ideal for agriculture. Kilauea is traditionally the home of Pele, the goddess of fire and volcanoes in Hawaiian mythology, the creator of the modern Hawaiian islands as she moved from island to island, destroying whatever had existed before her arrival, but also making new lands with rich soil. And despite the efforts of missionaries to erase the ways of ancient Hawaii, people still leave offerings for the goddess. Like anything, unfortunately, culture gets appropriated by people with no real connection to it. In the case of Pele, there is Pele's curse, where anyone who removes rocks from Hawaii will be cursed with bad luck by the goddess. This story has scared so many tourists who feel their lives have fallen apart after a Hawaiian vacation, they send random rocks and vials of sand back to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park to try and rid themselves of the curse so much the park essentially has to have a landfill for all the stuff. While in Hawaiian culture, removing items without a proper ritual is considered disrespectful, this curse was probably fabricated either by a park ranger who was sick of people removing things from the park, and so instead of threatening them with a fine, said they would be cursed, or, and this is my personal favorite version, a grumpy bus driver was tired of cleaning up sand and rocks people left on the bus, and so started telling people on the drive up to Kilauea about some curse made up at a local bar with some drinking buddies. Again, removing anything from the park is illegal. And come on, you don't need some piece of lava rock or a jar of sand to remember your vacation. Like, either take a picture, or don't be some annoying Instagrammer and try the radical concept of being in the moment. The volcanoes of Hawaii are shield volcanoes, which have highly fluid lava that can travel quite far, but the characteristics of Hawaiian volcanoes makes them relatively safe. They produce little volcanic gas and ash, and the lava, while very liquid, moves pretty slowly. Sometimes they do have more explosive eruptions, but in general, these volcanoes are more likely to destroy settlements than catch people unaware. This is opposed to the more common stratovolcanoes, built from layer upon layer of lava, and are far more likely to have devastating eruptions. All the volcanoes you have heard about, Mount St. Helens, which blew up, Mount Vesuvius, which destroyed Pompeii, Krakatoa, which blew up a whole island, and of course Mount Doom, the only place that can destroy the One Ring. These more explosive eruptions can create pyroclastic flows, which are incredibly dangerous as they are superheated clouds of dust moving at remarkable speed, which contrary to what certain movies involving dinosaurs say, you can neither outrun 
or survive if you get caught by them. While forces of destruction, volcanoes, though, are also creators. Volcanic ash, while dangerous when erupting out of a volcano, create rich soils when they settle. Volcanic eruptions were even critical in the early formation of Earth's atmosphere, and they form new lands like those of Hawaii, where life can arrive and thrive. I was definitely not alone on the rim of Kilauea. Besides all the tourists, I also had so many neighbors, the many organisms that thrive in and around Kilauea, able to take full advantage of what volcanoes have to offer. Let me introduce them to you. You would think a lake of molten rock would be completely devoid of life. No known living thing can survive the extreme temperatures of lava. They would simply be incinerated. However, just above this fiery pit, white birds circle. These are white-tailed tropic birds, seabirds that often prefer to nest on cliffs in the interior of the Hawaiian Islands over the rugged coast many other seabirds prefer. This colony has found the ultimate secure nesting site on an island of nest predators by nesting on a cliff where the floor is actually lava. When eruptions subside and the lava cools down to rock, it is a barren wasteland, sterilized by the fiery heat of the volcano. In Hawaii, though, this is just a fact of life, and so the organisms here have evolved to colonize these landscapes within months of the lava cooling. Uhini nene pele are crickets that only live on new flows, even before the tiny spores of ferns fall into cracks and move on before lush green is peeking out from the black rock. Few plants, though, are as quick to claim and dominate the lava fields as Ohia lehua. Their tiny seeds can fall into small cracks and find a foothold wherever they can, and soon young trees with flowering scarlet blooms are everywhere. So volcanic eruptions are, of course, destructive to the ecosystems that sort of surround them. However, once the eruption has subsided and the lava has cooled to stone, they create many unique potential opportunities for ecosystems to sort of invade and utilize. And one of those is lava tubes. Now this is the most um, famous and accessible lava tube on the Big Island of Hawaii, uh, Nahuku, um, or Thurston Lava Tube, but I don't really want to use that name just because um, Thurston, um, the guy that it's named for, uh, that it, that the honorary epithet is for, was really instrumental in the annexation of Hawaii, um, which is one of the U.S.'s more nefarious and darker bits of history. Lava tubes are formed when lava on the surface cools, while a fast-flowing stream of molten rock still travels underneath and is able to drain away. These are incredibly common in Hawaii, and perhaps the greatest danger of breaking trail in these forests, falling into the dark subterranean world that lies beneath. Again, the surface of the earth isn't entirely stable. Inside is a cool and wet habitat. Now... If you look up and shine a light on the ceiling of lava tubes on the Hawaiian, of the Hawaiian Islands, you will see roots hanging down um, from the ceiling. Now these are the roots of the ohia, which are the big trees that form most of the canopy of the archipelago, and they pierce into the subterranean passageways. And that little bit of gift, that little bit of nutrients from the uh, um, from photosynthesis high above us, is just enough nutrients that a tiny ecosystem is able to scratch out an existence down here. And so these islands are home to a wide range of native uh, troglofauna that, with the entire ecosystem having its sort of basis in ohia roots. Shrankia caterpillars munch on the roots. These caves offer a safer environment than the forests of predators above. 
In the darkness, deeper in these caves, troglobitic isopods, having lost their eyes in pigmentation, scuttle in the fallen vegetation they feed upon. Eventually, after traveling from the summit of a volcano or rift, lava reaches the surf of the Pacific, the cool waters pounding against the fire from within the earth, creating a dramatic landscape. Even here at the edge of the sea, volcanoes help create unique habitats for life. Like rocky coasts around the world, the erosion of lava rock under the tides creates rock pools, which are home to all sorts of strange animals, and also critical habitat for juvenile reef fish before they head out into the bustling reefs below the surf. The geology of igneous rocks, however, also creates a different and far rarer habitat, and keoline pools. When lava tubes form near the sea and run under the seabed before hitting the cool ocean, they can flood. If they open to the surface, away from the surf, the lighter fresh water from rain can make them less salty than the sea. In Hawaii, and keeline pools are home to the charismatic opaiula, tiny bright red shrimp that graze on algal mats, adapted to an ecosystem exposed to the blazing tropical sun and changing salinity levels as the tide rises and falls, these organisms are tough, even tougher than someone who isn't phased by falling on a'a. Uh -uh. Off the rugged coast, the effects of the volcanoes are still felt. Rock from recent eruptions are colonized by coral, eventually forming coral reefs in a dynamic landscape of arches and volcanic boulders creating a rich and vibrant ecosystem from the remnants of past violent eruptions. The sheltered volcanic bays of Hawaii offer refuge for creatures not only of the reef, but also the open sea. Spinner dolphins come to sleep here after a night of chasing squid offshore, and every winter, humpback whales from Alaska come on a Hawaiian vacation to give birth and have sex in these warm tropical waters. Below, colorful fish like the Lao Ipala and the Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apua'a dance through the coral of the young reef. Eventually, when the volcano's fire goes out and the mountain erodes away, it will be this reef that endures, an atoll marking where a volcano once stood. Volcanoes are a testament to really how insignificant our power is compared to the planet we call home, and how adaptable life can be, even in the harshest places. The duality of volcanoes as destroyers and creators makes the relationship we have with these fiery reminders of our planet's geology complex even more than the average relationship between two celebrities. Some fear them, others see opportunity. We can use them to make electricity. They create some of the richest soil for agriculture. We use volcanic rock for all sorts of applications, from construction to cosmetics, and yet they can destroy towns with ease. Anyway, welcome back to the Nature Misconception series. I have a great second season planned where we will explore the summits of volcanoes, swamps filled with alligators, and the depths of the ocean. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out season one and stay tuned for the next episode in this series exploring why islands are so freaking weird. Next time, this caterpillar is a killer, a predator of Hawaiian rainforest. Why on islands do such strange forms of life arise? <laughs>